everybody. It's time to start. Celebration. Is that what it says? Celebration. So that's what we're going to talk about today, a celebration. Um, it is Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, and so we're going to be talking this morning about the resurrection. Um, and our, our topic is going to be what the resurrection has done for us this morning, what it's done for us every day. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, so it should be good, I think. So if we turn to John 10, we'll get started. And we're going to read verses 11 to 18. Now, most of my, a lot of my text today is going to be out of the book of John. And then we'll have a couple from Paul as well. I think that Paul has some of the, out of all the, the New Testament, Paul gives us more about the resurrection. He gives us everything about the resurrection that we need to know. The Gospels have the story, and then they kind of stop at the story. Uh, except for Luke. Because in Luke, they go to Emmaus, and Jesus walks on the road with them, and he has dinner with them and explains who he is and why things had to happen. Um, but Paul has many things about the resurrection. And when Paul speaks about the resurrection, I think he's speaking about it with excitement and exclamation. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at this morning. And uh, we'll read this in a moment, but let's pray first. Lord, we're thankful that we're here together um, each Sunday uh, and each time we meet, uh, that there are folks that are willing to spend some time with us um, and listen to the things that are spoken, the things that are studied and shared, uh, and that those people would take these things to heart uh, and in mind and as we try to understand uh, more and more as we go through life uh, what our lives are about uh, in Christ. Um, and Lord, we thank you. Um, Father, we thank you for the things that uh, you accomplished through Christ uh, for us. And I pray that every day that your spirit will work within us um, to, to keep in our hearts and minds uh, who we are in you, uh, that we can set out and accomplish and do the things that you would have us to do um, as we live. Amen. So, in John chapter 10, 11 to 18, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who has a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So Jesus is saying, I am the one that's going to take everybody to me. The flock that I'm here for now, and the flock that's not part of the flock yet. But when I accomplish what I'm about to accomplish, all are going to be part of my flock, and all are going to come to me. You know, I, I think uh, a lot of times when we, we see drawings and paintings of the good shepherd, there's like five sheep, right? Uh, and I know I've, I've seen videos of uh, 
in Ireland or wherever where there's sheep and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sheep all going down the road, right? And there's one guy up there in a car or whatever, and they're all following this guy. And then he's got some dogs that work to keep them in line. And amazing that they are able to get all those sheep into one field, right? A lot of sheep, not just a few, but all of the sheep, the entire flock is going to become one. And he says the reason that his father, God, loves him is because he's laying down his life and that he's going to take back his life. And no one takes his life from him. No one. You know, a lot of times we talk about Jesus dying on the cross and we talk about what well, was the Romans, what well, was the Jews. They carried out the act, but Jesus gave himself for that to happen. He didn't fight back. He didn't call down legions of angels to stop it or to defeat anybody. He gave himself. And not only did he give himself, but he says, I love the word authority. I have authority to lay my life down. Nobody else. But also given to him was the authority to take it up again. And that he says, it's a commandment. This is what my father told me to do. So this is what I'm doing. So what does the resurrection bring? What does it do? Well, there we see part of it is about gathering everybody into a flock and him being the shepherd. Now, you know, he talks about the hired hands. There were hired hands. They weren't really hired hands, but uh, in his, the way he's describing it, there were people that rose up to become messiahs and to try to grab everybody to them. There were saviors that rose up to try to bring everybody, but they all had their own thoughts and their own devices and their own reasons. And they fail. Jesus is the only one. He's the one. All the other ones... The supposed ones were thieves, they were robbers, and they were bent on stealing the flock for their own purposes. They claimed they came to rescue and to save, but only Jesus came to actually save, to rescue, and to set free all who were captured, stolen, and oppressed. Because that's what we are. Not just them, but all of us until we actually understand who we are. In Luke, when Jesus talks about the parable, I think it's Luke 15, he says that uh, he talks about the woman and the lost coin, and then he talks about the lost sheep. He goes out, and they find every single lost sheep. None of them are left behind. Not one is left behind. So he came to gather all for the Father, which is everything. In John chapter 6, you could turn over there. And we're going to read verses 37 to 40. It says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. And as we just read, he said, I have other sheep which are not of the fold. And I have to bring them. And they're going to hear my voice. When I do what the Father sent me to do, when I give up my life, and when I take it up again and raise again, everyone, all life is going to see me and come to me. All of it. 
because the Father has laid into my hands everything. And of everything he has put in my hands, I will not lose any of it. Nothing. He will die on the cross. He'll see the burial and he'll rise because of the Father's will. This was an act that was meticulously planned out by the Father. This is not like a, there's a battle going on with spiritual forces and the bad guys win part of the battle. And so God has to run back to the tent and call his generals together and pen out some new strategy so they can overcome. God planned this out. And he had his son to carry it out. They knew that there was going to be a victory. Jesus said again, no one has taken it away from me. But I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This is the commandment I received from my father. Planned all of it. They knew exactly what was going to happen. Jesus knew what was going to happen. And the father knew what was going to happen. And it was going to be carried out. And God loved the world. And so he gave his son for this in John 3.16. So the resurrection brings everything to the Father. You don't have to turn there. This is John 15, 13. It says, Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for his friends. And now we know that his friends are who? Everyone. He counts everyone that's his friends. I don't believe that today Jesus has an enemy. Even the ones that are anti-Christ or anti-Jesus, he doesn't count as enemies. In Romans 5, Paul said, when we were enemies, he came and died. Right? And that Part of his resurrection, his death and burial and resurrection was to overcome that fact that there were actual enemies against him. And so even though a person might see themselves or we might see someone as an enemy of God, when God the Father looks at them, he doesn't see an enemy. Right? To me, that's, that's kind of what you could take out of this. It is the greatest act, laying down his life, the greatest, he says, picture of love. Self-sacrifice. Cruciform life. Cruciform living. Like the cross. This is what Jesus was called to do. He said in John 12, 32, And if I am lifted up from the earth on a cross... I will draw all men, all, to myself. None will be left behind. All of humanity are rescued. I know often I speak of the powers of the world and systems of the world and systems of religion as the same thing, worldly powers. But if we think of powers, and there's three, there's powers of the world, powers of religion, and powers of self. And Jesus came to defeat all of that and to rescue us from all of it. And I know we've looked at this before, but that word draw in John 12, 32, if you look up at the meaning of the Greek, it can mean to be drawn, pulled in, dragged out. Picture a lamb or a sheep, and they're all running through this field, and there's a ravine and the sheep falls in it or some type of irrigation ditch or something that's, you know, five feet deep and the sheep can't get out. And you picture a man, he's got that sheep by, the, by his front legs and he's working super hard to pull him out. And he jumps down in the ditch and is trying to push him out. And he finally gets the sheep out, all muddy and filthy and dirty. That guy went down in it to get that sheep out. That's what Jesus did. 
And in that act, according to Paul, all of us went through that with him. Not physically, but spiritually. In God's mind, all of humanity, every single person, that's happened to. They died, they were buried, and they rose again. And Jesus was raised up into newness of life. To free, to save, to rescue. Now I'm going to read something I, I found online. Uh, I just wanted to find quotes and things about what other people... I just want to see what do other people think about the resurrection. And I happen to use the very first one, which is not even spoken by a person, but spoken by something called, that I have just started learning about, Copilot. Right? It's AI. You type in something, and instead of now just getting the list of everything you're looking for, there's a little blurb at the top. And you can press chat, and in the next to it, it starts talking to you about all the things that it found to show you, which is kind of neat. But this is what it says. It says the resurrection changes people from being spiritually dead to being alive to God. It changes guilty condemnation into a celebration of forgiveness. I added some things. And freedom. It ends our slavery to the systems of the world. And I'll say to the systems of ourselves. It changes anxiety into a hope that goes beyond the grave. It's a celebration. And I try to read the, uh, the, the things in the Gospels, and I, I know they're excited when they finally realize that Jesus is in the grave. But I don't think that they truly were able to celebrate everything that happened, everything that it accomplished, because they still didn't understand everything that it meant, right? The resurrection, though, is a celebration for us. We should be celebrating this resurrection every single moment of our lives because it changes who we are in here, spiritually. And if we realize it, then that change can go from in here and right here out through our hands, through our feet, through our mouths, through our eyes, into everything that we do in our lives. So let's turn over to Romans, and we're going to read in chapter 6. And I said Paul had some amazing things to say about the resurrection. If anybody wants to know what the resurrection really accomplished, other than Jesus coming up out of the grave and defeating death, they have to read from the Apostle Paul. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, this is what the resurrection is for. It's because when you were alive, 
and you were following after the world, and you were following after sin, and you were following after yourself, you were in the wrong path, going the wrong way in the wrong direction. So Jesus died and took all of that to the grave with him. And when he came up, he left it behind. And so he was new. And Paul is saying that in the mind of God, we all did the same thing. We all died. We all went to the grave. And everything that was us in our former way of life is gone. It was left there. Because he says, Paul says, can a dead man sin? No. Because he's dead. So when he pulls him up out of the grave and the sin is left there, what's left? What God has made you is what's left. That's why he says in verse 11, consider yourselves to be dead to it, to all of it, and alive to God. That is what the resurrection accomplished. Paul expounds in his writings, and he says numerous times that we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. This is a newness that was made possible by the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Without it, it never could have happened. So when we see humanity before the cross, burial, and resurrection, we shouldn't look back at history and say, well, we haven't learned anything. We're just the same way. We should be looking back at history and saying, we might do some of the same things we did back there. But if we knew and understood, after the resurrection, all of that is nothing. And there's a new way for us to proceed. A new way. Turn over to Ephesians, and we're going to read uh, from chapter 1, verse 18, and then we're going to read through chapter 2 in verse 6. Paul knows what the resurrection accomplished. But when he looks out at everybody, Ephesians 1, when he looks out at everybody and sees them, he sees a lot of people who really don't understand what happened. And so what does he say in Ephesians? He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. He's praying and praying that you're going to see it. This is what happened for you. It can change your life. He says, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? If you don't believe it, then the power is lost on you. It doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means you haven't accepted it. You don't believe it. It is what it is. And that power lays in you, crushed under the weight of the world, its powers, and you and your powers. He says, these, this greatness and this power, are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Jesus was a man. He was a human being. Now, there was more about him than that. But when he walked on this earth, when he went to that cross and suffered the horrible things that he did to go on that cross, he suffered like a man. That body went into the grave, just like ours do. And the power of God was that he took that when they went in the grave, what did they see? Nothing. Nothing. They didn't see a body. They saw nothing. God took all of it, and he changed it into something new. And he sat that man, Jesus Christ, at his right hand in the heavenly places. And Paul goes on to say, far above 
all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, the age that they were in that was coming to a close, but in the one to come, the one we're in. There is nothing in this world, no person that is above the name of Christ. None. It says, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I read that statement, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Fills is a word that we could say is past, it's present, and it's future. It's an eternal word. Filling it, filling it, filling it, filling it, filling it, non-stop. So that he is all in all. You know, I used to think, and we I think we used to think that, well, all in all, the people who believe, all in all in the future, when everybody is before him and says every knee and every Every knee, every eye shall see him. They should all bow down and out of the mouth all confess that he is who he is. But oh, I read that he fills all in all. To me, he fills all in all. Everybody. Every, I'll say every, not just people, everything with life is filled with God. Everything. He goes on to say, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them too, we all, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, us, humanity, everyone, there's nobody excluded from that. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because of the resurrection, you today are sitting in Christ, with Christ, next to God. You, right now, God can turn to his right and see his son sitting there and in his son see all of humanity, all life together. That is what the resurrection accomplished. And to me, that passage is as important of, as a resurrection passage as any other. What does it mean? We can read from the Gospels of the scene, but what it truly meant for humanity, for all of us, was not realized immediately. What does John say the apostles did? They went home. Jesus went on the beach, and what did he find him doing? Working. They went back to work. The work that they left behind when Jesus called them, once Jesus was gone, they just went back to it. They went back to life as normal. Not as normal in their minds, because I'm sure they had a lot of questions, a lot of confusion. What's next? What are we supposed to do? Well, we don't know. So let's go back to work, right? But that's not what God wants. Once you realize the power of that resurrection in you, he wants you to do something with it, right? And so what did the apostles do once they started realizing it? They went out and started talking about it and teaching and telling people. This is what it was. They celebrated it. 
And the celebration becomes in the form of how we live and think. The Apostle Paul is the one who really expounds, and we know that came from the Spirit of God, teaching Paul, this is what happened, and I'm telling you right now what it meant. And I need you to go out and tell people what it meant. And so that's what Paul did. He went out. He founded churches or groups of people. He taught people who could go do the same thing. And the word spread. It didn't spread perfectly in the exact manner Paul said it. We know that different people taught different things. But one thing they taught. Jesus was the son of God. He died on the cross. He was buried and he rose. And this is what it means for us. And that was the beginning Paul was enlightening people to the fact that the resurrection has made you new. In Ephesians 4.24, he says, put on the new self. And that new self is modeled after, is in the likeness of God the Father. Is it too much to say that I'm putting on God the Father? That's what he said. This new body, this new self that you can put on yourself right now is in the likeness of God. So everything that God has for us that is laid out in the scriptures that we can see, we can be part of. There's a song by Hillsong, and I can't think of the name of it, which is unbelievable because I listen to them so much. But that's what the song's about. The person is desiring a part of heaven on the earth. And every time I listen to that song, I'm like, but you are the part of heaven on earth. I am the part of heaven on earth. So when I'm walking around at work and doing everything in my life, do I model heaven? That's what we're supposed to be doing. Do we do it? Not all the time. But it should be in our minds in our celebration of life and how we think. In Colossians 3, 1 to 3, you could turn over there. Paul says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Where in Ephesians, he said, so are you. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Paul says, therefore, if, he's not saying, if you have been. He's saying, he's not saying it, there's a possibility of it, but you haven't done it. He's saying it has happened. And if it has happened to you, then why aren't you doing it? Right? If you don't have a car and someone drops a new car in your driveway and it's this beautiful automobile and you keep walking to work, they could say, if I just gave you a car, why aren't you driving it? That's what Paul is saying. If you've been raised up with Christ in his resurrection, because you have been, then why are your, is your mind still on things of the earth? Your mind should be on the things of heaven. Because you died to the things on the earth. And now you are hidden in Christ. In God. That's where you are. That's where we are. It's almost like if we could hang ourselves upside down. And hang from the sky, our feet up there and our heads down here. And we walk along and everything just flows out of us. That's exactly what it is. And it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter the horrible things that are going on around you or even happening to you. Christ went through that. So even though those things are happening, you still live heaven on earth. He continues. If you go down to verse 10, he says, if you put on the new self 
who was being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, him, the new self, renewed, happens to mean that you're being renewed. It's not over. It's happening. In your life, every day, there's that renewal, and you're drawn closer to the true knowledge. He says, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ. And in Galatians, he adds, there's no women, there's no men. We're just human beings. I listened to a guy, I was listening to something that was kind of neat. I watched it on Facebook and uh, he said that we all consider ourselves to be human beings on this planet. And he says, but that's false. Christ came to show us what a human being looked like. He said, I always say Christ came to show us what human beings are supposed to be. He said that Christ came to show you what a human being looks like. And if you're not living Christ-like, then you are not a human being. I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. There's no distinctions between anybody. Christ is all. And in all. Not Christ is going to be all in all. Christ is all and in all. All are with him. All are in him. He is in all. The resurrection changes everyone. If you are not in this process of renewal, of changing, then we don't understand the resurrection. And we don't understand the power, immense, incredible power, that the resurrection has put inside of us. It's incredible. And every day I know I'm not always in that process. And so I forget what it did for me. If we don't understand, then the resurrection remains what it is, or I'll say the majority of Christianity this morning. It remains a feel-good story that we celebrate every spring on Easter. Christ rose from the dead. He's the Son of God. And then we leave and we go out, and what happens? We do exactly what the apostles did. Go back to work. Go back to life as usual. And we forget that it is a continual process, a continual removal that God has started in us. This doesn't mean don't celebrate. It doesn't mean that people can't get together once a year on Easter Sunday and celebrate the resurrection and, and then go celebrate. I was thinking today about eating. And that's a celebration. You know, some cultures, when they eat, they get everybody together. It's exciting every time they eat. It's the thing where they all get together and they all share what's going on in their lives. And it's an amazing time. You know, in the, the town of uh, Medina, not too far from us, Lisa and I have never done it, but I've always thought it would be cool to take part. They do so many neat things in that town. And I don't want to understand why other towns don't do the same thing. But once a year, they have tables that line the whole street downtown. And all the local produce and local farmers and meats and everything are all brought together and meals are prepared and you can go take part of that part in that all these people together that is a celebration what are they celebrating they're celebrating the harvest the farm harvest agriculture we should be celebrating everything in that way the resurrection of christ Carl, I think you said my name, so you must have something to say. Celebration hams. Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't eat ham, so I don't understand. Why is it called a celebration ham? I don't know. Because it's big and it's got fat all over it and it's sweet. I remember that. Uh, 
I remember when I used to eat meat when I was a kid, I loved chewing on that fat because it was so sweet, right? It's amazing. But that's way off the topic. <laughs> but that's it. Celebration. We're celebrating. So let's go to John 20, and we'll read the resurrection story. And then as we're reading it, think about what the resurrection is and what it was. And the people in this story don't yet understand it. And we don't read about Mary Magdalene in Paul's writings. But you have to wonder what, when they, someone who had been with Christ through his life, through his ministry, and seen everything he had done, somebody in Mary Magdalene who it says had seven demons, and all the ailments come along with it, and she res he rescues her and heals her, and she supports him and feeds him and takes care of him through his ministry, and then he dies. And they're probably distraught. They are. I can't believe this. And then when they realize he's not there anymore, and they don't know what it means, once they start understanding what it means, imagine how much more it meant to them that I was with him. I was with him. I ate with him. I saw him do these amazing things. I saw him die. I saw him raise. And now I know what he did. And accomplished for me. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. So Peter and the other disciples went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together. And the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings laying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth, which had been laid on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up and placed by itself." Almost like Jesus sat up and took the cloth off his head and sat there rolling it up to neatly lay it down. That's pretty cool just to imagine that, right? So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Not only did they not understand the scripture that he was going to rise from the dead. But they didn't understand why and what it was going to, what it meant for everybody. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. That is how new the resurrection makes you so new that you cannot recognize the person that you once were. That is how new. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. 
So she tells them the first things that Jesus said. I'm going up to the Father. And not only is he my Father, but he's your Father. He's my God, and he's your God because of what I just did. And then Paul's going to go on, as we just read. And he's going to tell us what it means that he's my God. It means that I can put on the likeness of my God every day in renewal of life because of the resurrection. That is worth celebration every day. Amen. Amen.